Hey guys, I'm back. Man, today I've been having a lot of technical difficulties on the, the reality show today. We had some trouble with the microphone and that was such a bummer. And it looks like I'm having trouble getting my comment comments feed. So maybe you guys could jump jump back on this one. We canceled the first feed and now we're going live again. So hopefully you guys can pick it up, see that we're starting to build up the show again. Robert Garrett is watching. Thanks for waving. I got my buddy here, Sammy. Oh, Sammy's just chilling. Sammy's taking a nap. Sammy, you're... I like what you're doing down there. Let's wait for everyone to jump back on. Robert, did you have any questions? Let me know. Robert, this is very interesting. Your the data you were pulling from the data you were pulling on the the first four or five shots, the the tactical data. That was cool. We could talk about that. I have Doug Kruger back on. Doug, let's continue that conversation. Amazing. The difference between high school. Uh, participation and tournament participation that's huge you know everyone will, will climb back on here in a moment but it looks like I'm getting your comments again yeah everything's coming on again so I wanted to talk about first four shots the myths I think it's a myth you know this is coming from Craig O'Shaughnessy's research and I don't know if anyone else has done research on this I think a lot of it's coming from Craig but, you know, I, I disagree. I don't think that, that we should be focusing on the first four shots in, in early training of, of kids. I think young kids should learn a good base of consistency, and that is the Spanish way. So that's, that was a big topic last week, and I'd be happy to continue that conversation. If you guys have any technical questions, let me know. I'd love to talk technique. That's one of my favorite subjects. I would like to talk about... GBA, I'd love to talk about gains-based approach. If anyone has an opinion, question about that. been having a lot of discussion on Facebook this week with some games-based guys in England. Man, these guys are completely drinking the Kool-Aid on GBA, like completely brainwashed. And it's like GBA or the highway. You cannot... You cannot teach technique. Technique is almost a dirty word, I think, in some of these areas that are complete diehard GBA locales, like, like England's one of them, where games-based approach is huge in under 10. I mean, it's all over the world now, but I mean, I think there's so many fallacies in, in GBA. There's some good things in GBA, too, that I like, but a lot of flaws in logic and argumentation when it comes to games-based approach. So I'm very interested in that, especially now because I'm a, I work with so many kids under 10 years old. So, so GBA is, is, is very interesting to me as a topic. It is uh, something that I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert on, but I have studied it a lot. I'm, I'm fairly knowledgeable about it. I try to use GBA when I can because I like training the cognitive aspect the tactical aspects for my players, but I'm a big mo motor skills guy. You know, I'm a technician. I've always been a technician. So I try to work in cognitive as much as I can. I try to use games and gamification when I can, but never, never to where it's going to interfere with my technical work because I believe technical work is so important for young kids. And also, I have a question about whether we cannot do the tactical and cognitive a bit later. You know, this is kind of the formula in Spain. They, they have many, many players from Russia and Eastern Europe who are, who are learning without cognitive, without much of a cognitive approach. They're learning mostly skills and technique. And then they go to Spain when they're like teenagers. And in Spain, they learn how to play on clay. They learn tactics. They learn strategy. And it seems to work pretty well. It's a wonderful formula. So th that's sort of my question. Does it have to be so cognitive and tactical at six or seven or eight? I don't think it does. And I, I think at those ages, you can, you can do some 
incredible stuff technically and get everything hardwired. That, that's my preference. So that's sort of where I'm coming from in terms of GBA. There's, there's such a move to stress tactics and cognitive and, and, and strategic. But I think those, those areas can be worked on effectively as the child gets older, once the technique is, is rock solid. And I like to in, in, include some cognitive and tactical in my technical work, but but for me, the technique is so important when the kids are young and the footwork and the, the physical motoric training. So that's where I'm coming from vis-a-vis uh, -vis GBA. With the four, first four shots, you know, I'll get into that too if you'd like, guys. Last week was an amazing show and we were, I, I got a little too heated. I, I didn't feel comfortable sh continuing to share that show because I was naming names and I was... I was dishing out a lot of shade. I felt, I felt a little uncomfortable. It was an amazing show. I loved it. It was entertaining. I know a lot of people told me it was very entertaining, but uh, it was a little too personal. You know, I started getting other people's business. I, I don't, don't want to get too, too much uh, criticism for that. Anyway, but I would like to talk about the myth of the first four shots because everyone's training the first four shots now, and I think it's very misguided. So I'd like to get into that conversation later. All right, we have Irma Maribel Bonilla is watching. Richard Bowie, my friend, is on the program. What's up, Richard? How are you? Very good coach, very accomplished coach. Apparently back in New York, Richard. That's cool. I didn't know you were based in New York. That's awesome. Richard says, do you see a decline in high-level players from Spain? Absolutely. Spanish tennis is on the decline. I've been talking about that for a while now. They're, the native-born Spanish players are going down at the high level. They had an amazing run. And what can I say? 30 years, 30, 30 to 40 years, Spain, it was a perfect storm. It was a miracle. They put so many players in the top 100 on the men's side, 13, 14 players consistently for a small country. It was amazing. And now they're going down. You know, what, what can you say? They can't have, Rafa's going to retire probably in the next few years, who knows? He's amazing. And, and a lot of the players are older, and they're probably going to end up with, I don't know, 6 to 10 top 100 players. And that's what it's going to look like. But what I've talked about a lot is Spain is becoming a training ground for international players. So Spain is not, perhaps not the big leader on the ATP Tour anymore in terms of number of players that are native born from Spain, but people often forget how many international players are training in Spain. They make, tr they make Spain their home base. They make Spain their headquarters. And there's so many international players doing that. It started back in the day with all the Russian players like Murat Safin and his sister Dinara and Igor Andreev and many Russian players went to Spain back in the... I would say late 80s, early 90s. And also you have the amazing story of Andy Murray from England. So there's a big, there's a big migration from the northern European countries and the eastern Euro European countries into Spain. So there, I think that will always be true. But now you're seeing players from all over the world going to Spain. And you're seeing the academy system in Spain blowing up the commercial academies are all over the place. I think it's actually a negative to a certain extent. Some of the quality has gone down. There's a lot of people. It's kind of like a gold rush. It's like the California gold rush. Everyone's moving to Spain, start an academy. People, academies are popping up everywhere. Everyone's got a Spanish academy now. And that's probably a, a positive for in some ways, but it's also a negative because the, the quality may not be so good and there's some crass commercialism happening in Spain now, which I've never seen before. Spain used to be very legit and serious and relatively a commercial, not, not, not very commercial. And now everything's changed. Rafa's Academy has changed everything. Rafa's Academy is the 800 pound gorilla in Spain and they have a huge marketing engine and a sales engine and a network of 
a network of people around the world that they that that they, they, they work off commission, you know, sending people to Rafa's Academy. And they're a huge competitor now in Spain. They're they're really hurting the businesses of the other academies on the mainland. I think that's a really troublesome challenge for many of the Spanish academies on the mainland. You know, the academies on the mainland are are hurting. I think their numbers are way down because of Rafa's marketing and sales engine. And people are bypassing Barcelona now and Valencia to go to Mallorca because Rafa's the magnet of Rafa's Academy is there. And Rafa's Academy is much more powerful in terms of their marketing skill and their advertising expertise and their digital and social media presence, you know, they're much more advanced than what I've seen from the old school academies in Barcelona and Valencia and Alicante. So I, I think the mainland traditional academies in Spain are in, are in a lot of trouble and they have, they have to step up their game to compete with the Rafa Nadal Academy on Mallorca. But what Richard says, and I think my comments are working out. Guys, if you have any questions, please send them out to me. I know the show will start ticking back up again as I stay live here. I think we lost our first feed, and that was a shame because I think Wes shared it on CTC. and That, that was awesome, Wes. I appreciate that. But we'll, we'll pick up some steam again. We're, we had a, 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 big, a big following there for a little while, and then I lost my – maybe that's why my comments mm -hmm. froze. Uh, Richard Bowie says suckers will buy into it. Yeah, there's a lot of academies that are that are shady in Spain now. There's a lot of new academies that are being run by internationals. In, in other words, former players and coaches who are not Spanish. That always concerns me in Spain if they market themselves as a Spanish academy. And there's just a lot of questionable quality of training. And I just... I have many parents who come to me for recommendations on where to train in Spain because I, I wrote the book and I've been traveling there a long time now, over a decade now, and I try to steer them to the tried and true academies, the ones that have been around for a long time and the ones that have a good reputation, the ones that I've been to and I've, I've spoken with the, the head coaches and directors and I know that they, have, they do a good job and they're responsible. And I just can't vouch for all the new ones popping up. There, there seems to be new ones popping up like the California Gold Rush right now in Spain. But I think what's going to happen is Spain will become a training ground like the way Florida is, the way South Florida is, particularly around Southeast Florida, around Miami, or the way it is around Bradenton or Tampa. I think that you will see pockets of that in Spain. Spain, I think, will always be an incredible training base. Because of its location in Europe, it has a great lo location in Europe where players can train on red clay with good weather and they can travel to all the tournaments close by in Europe. I think Spain will always have that advantage and they'll always have a lot of good training because they, ha they still have so many former players from the professional tours that who are now in coaching in Spain. That, that's something that's very unique to Spain. They have these dozens and dozens of high-level former players from the past 30 years. And a lot of those players are giving back and coaching. A lot of those players are in academies working or coaching privately now. And so the coaching level in Spain is very much like Florida. In Florida, I think the coaching level is extremely high. Also for that reason, because the, there are so many top professional players who are playing or retired in Florida. And so you get an incredible, you get an incredible, level of coaching in Florida. So I think that Spain will also have that same reputation as a training hub. And I'm not sure what's going to happen to Spain on the pro tour. I, I, what I expect is it will probably maintain six to 10 players in the top hundred. You may see more Spanish women coming out because of Muguruza. Uh, she's amazing. She trained with my mentor, Bruguera, for many years at the Bruguera Academy. She trained about seven years there since she was a young kid. Amazing story that a lot of people don't talk about. I've written about it for, for several publications, Muguruza's story at Bruguera. So I think the women may make a move in Spain because historically the men have always dominated the world tour from Spain. And I think 
that Spain will become this, this magnet for players for internationally. And I think people need to try to remember how many top international players have come out of Spain. I have to write an article soon where I list, I, I've talked about this a lot, but I have to make a list of the best world tour players who are not Spanish. They're not native Spanish players, but they're, they're international players who spent a significant amount of time training in Spain. And if, if you look at the top 100 there's a significant chunk of players who train in Spain, who use Spain as a training hub. Like I said, partly because of the, the courts, the clay courts and the weather, and partly because of the location in Europe. Barcelona has an amazing centralized location, an amazing airport, and you can fly to anything within a few hours from Barcelona. So I think that's never going to change. And Spain will continue to dominate in terms of coaching and academies and things like that. But I am worried about all of the new academies that are popping up out of the woodwork who are, that are not proven and that have questionable have a questionable track record, things like that. So you have to be really careful going to Spain now. There's a lot of new, newer academies with, that I think are shady. You know, I, I would be very skeptical before signing up. I, I try to stick with the tried and true uh, programs that have been around a long time in Spain, places that I know well. Okay, Robert Garrett has a few questions here, I think. He says, there is no magic potion, talented kid, great coach, dedicated parents, player that is willing to work. When you have those ingredients, then you work super hard. The academies are not a magic potion. Yeah, Robert, that's true. And the academies are not necessarily the only way you know there are many top players who did it privately and the academy road is only one road it, it's not true that you have to train at an academy to make it on the pro tour and I would also say to you guys that the kids who make it at an academy they're not just getting shipped to an academy without their parent without either both parents or usually one parent usually one parent's making the dollars and the other parents running the show at the academy. And I think that there are so many parents who don't understand that. And what they do is they, they see the results of an academy and they send their kid. They send their kid over there just trusting that the academy is going to do it. And that's not how it works. The, you need to have a parent on site. You need to have a liaison on site at all times at an academy. And that usually is mom or dad. It could be a, a coach or a, an uncle or a family member, but they have to be on it 24-7 so that the kid gets the best possible training and the best poss possible matches and the best possible coaching. And as they say, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And you need a parent on site being the squeaky wheel all the time at an academy. It is absolutely huge mistake to trust that you can just send your kid off to an academy for six months or a year with no supervision from the parent or, or a, a, you know, a, a someone, someone who's responsible for that kid and expect the same results as a kid who's there with the parent every day. Trust me, when a parent's on site every day at an academy, that kid is getting the best. The coaches all know it. The director of the academy knows it. And if that parent is difficult and demanding, that kid's getting everything. And the kids that are not, that don't have their parent there, the kids that don't have someone supervising them there, those kids kind of get, I hate to say it, but they sort of, they get a little bit neglected. They don't get the same attention. They, they can slip through the cracks very easily. And that's the classic academy mistake. If you're sending your kid to an academy, parent has to be on site. And that's how all the top players who have ever done it. That's how they do it. In my opinion, it's very rare, extremely rare that a kid makes it and the parents just sent the kid off and, and the academy did the rest. I, I think that's very rare. I don't know if that's ever happened. It's probably happened, but it's extremely rare. All right, so I've gotten a lot of energy here, more people signing on. I appreciate you guys picking up the feed. They had a good question here. I will try to catch it. What was the question, guys? I think I missed it. Robert said it's a good question. Is it from Gordon Paul? All right, Gordon Paul. He's my buddy. He's coming up for training. Gordon, are you coming up for the coaches training January 21st? We're going to simulcast that. It's going to be awesome. 
well, we're going to try to live feed it on YouTube or Facebook. It's a whole workshop. It's a day-long workshop, advanced tennis drills from Spain. So it's advanced Spanish tennis drills. And I'm, I'm going to be going over my favorite drills that I haven't really shared before too often because most of the time I focus on, on explaining you know, basic and fundamental drills. We're going to go through some advanced drills for advanced players that a lot of people haven't seen. Yeah, it's going to be great. And we're going to either live, we possibly live feed that, or we're going to definitely film that and share it with folks. So it's going to be really cool. Okay, Gordon Paul says, how does Bruguera Academy rate versus the Florida Academies versus other Spanish Academies? And is that the question you wanted me to answer, Robert? So, you know, guys, I love talking about Spanish tennis. I could rap all night on Spain. So let's dig into it a little bit. Let's talk about Bruguera. Bruguera is my home in Spain, my home away from home. And Luis Bruguera has been a mentor to me for the past going on a dozen years now. I have a very close relationship with him. And I know the family, the Bruguera family. So I have to be generous in my my comments about Bruguera. I, I, I love the Bruguera system. I, I use I use the Bruguera system. It's called now the Bruguera method and it's relatively unknown around the world. I've shared a lot of it. I think from what people know about it, what people know about it is from what I've shared, either through my writing or through some of the videos that I've that I've posted on YouTube or in other places and in some of my articles and from my book, but I think the Bruguera method is very esoteric to folks. It's not well known. It's, I wouldn't say it's a secret. It's just, he doesn't publicize a lot. He doesn't market himself that much. Luis, Luis is the, 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 the grandfather of Spanish tennis, one of the grandfathers of Spanish tennis, along with William Pato Alvarez. And William Pato Alvarez is another guy who doesn't market that much, you know, worldwide or on, they, they don't do a lot of social media. You know, in Spain, they're not really on the cutting edge of digital, digital marketing. So, so the Bruguera system is not very well known. Basically what it is, it's, it's a little traditional. The, he stresses the closed stance. He doesn't work too much with open modern stances. And he's a big believer in developing racket acceleration, the way Sergi played. And when the kids are young, they actually play quite flat. So there was a very interesting question on Facebook that I need to answer. It was by Mark Lucero, who is a WTA coach, uh, used to be a USDA national coach. And he, he posed a very good question on whether you should train kids to, to develop spin first or to train kids to develop more flat strokes like Lansdorp first. And he was sort of comparing the Spanish style to Lansdorp. And I'm going to answer that post maybe later tonight or tomorrow. I'm going to try to go through some of the Facebook group posts. We've been having an incredible discussion on Tennis House and CTC, competitive tennis coaches, uh, with with some different topics, but one of the topics was Spanish training versus the style of, say, Robert Lansdorp, you know, driving through the ball flatter. So Mark felt it was easier to teach kids the flatter style and then add the spin later. And I really need to think about how I want to answer that because I think there's probably some truth to that, but I also want to sort of flip it around and say, okay, can we train kids spin first and then add the power shots later. Is that is that a problem or is that doable? And I'm wondering if you can do it both ways effectively and efficiently because I'm all about doing things fast and efficient. Another thing that I notice about my own method is that I teach the spin first really early. So I'm talking at five, six, seven, eight because I think it promotes a good swing path to be able to hit spin. But then I noticed that when the kids are like 9, 10, 11, 12, I spend a lot of time on driving the ball for pace. And I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I don't, I don't think you, you have to develop just spin or just driving the ball the way Lansdorp does or just heavy spin the way other, some coaches do. And I think it's also a really big myth that people have that in Spain they, they develop only topspin and not driving the ball. 
Take Luis Bruguera, for example. He's huge on driving the ball. In fact, all the kids at Bruguera hit, in my opinion, way too flat in the younger years. I bring kids there. I brought kids there for 10 years. I brought a team from the U.S. there for 10 years. And I had a problem with the way they were teaching all of my students. They were teaching them to flatten the ball out. There's a lot of young kids. And I wanted the kids to play with more whip and more topspin, and, and the Bruguera system teaches a very flat ball and a very closed stance. I wanted the kids to play open stance, semi-open, uh, with good rotation, and Bruguera has all the kids grounded, hitting flat balls, but working on extension. You, you guys would be shocked at this, but the Bruguera method for young kids is very much like Lansdorp in terms of extending through the ball. He's a huge believer in that, and it's very old school in that sense. And so I think there's this mistake that people make when they think about Spain. They think that all the coaches over there are teaching open stance and heavy spin to all the young kids. And that's absolutely not the case. The Bruguera system is a prime example of that. Take the Sanchez-Casal system, which is based off of Pato Alvarez. The Sanchez-Casal system in Spain is very traditional. A lot of stepping into the ball, a lot of closed stance, neutral stance. Not a huge emphasis on spin in the younger years. And those two systems predominate in Spain. The, the philosophy of Luis Bruguera and the philosophy of Pato Alvarez have permeated all throughout Spain. And coaches have, have copied their methods and philosophy and they've taken some of the best things that they do. And some of the coaches are evolving the methods of Luis and Pato. But... Those two grandfathers of Spanish tennis have influenced Spanish tennis, I think, more than any other coaches in Spain. I, I truly believe that through all the research that I've done there. So let me try to catch up on some of the questions here. Guys, if you have a follow-up on Spain, please ask me. But I think that's a really interesting point, that in Spain they teach a lot of flat balls and a lot of traditional stances in the traditional academies there. Now, I'm not saying that's right. I think I actually disagree with that to a certain extent. I would like to see them modernizing their technical approach, but that's what they do. So for people that say in Spain, oh, yeah, they just teach a lot of topspin, and, you know, they're grinding from way back. They do grind from way back. A lot of the academies do. We could talk about court position, too, because one of the things about Bruguera, Gordon, is that they, they I think he gives up way too much court position. You know, the Bruguera system historically has given up a lot of court position. They play way back. They play way back the way Rafa does. And I think that that's always been a criticism of the Bruguera Academy style, that, that the players give up way too much ground. And some of the other academies in Spain don't do that. They, they try to pressure the baseline more. And I think those academies are more on the cutting edge. They're taking time away. So you have to really examine what academy you're talking about, what system and method you're talking about. I think I have a visitor here. Do I have a visitor? No, oh, my daughter came down. My daughter came down to say hello. I think she, said, she wanted to say goodnight. Sky, you want to say goodnight? Oh, she got, she got embarrassed. She didn't want to be on the show. But guys, we have a great audience tonight. I, I'm seeing a lot of energy, a lot of viewers, more viewers than I think we've ever had. The show is blowing up. And I'm going to continue doing this every Sunday night, 9.45 p.m. I love talking tennis. You guys got me started on Spanish tennis. I had topics. I was going to talk about GBA, games-based approach, and the, you know, Craig O'Shaughnessy's research on the first four shots, which, which I think is somewhat of a myth. And you guys got me talking about Spanish tennis, but I love talking about Spanish tennis. So I guess everyone's happy tonight, including myself. Gordon, I'll try to get back to your question a bit later. I just need to check some of the other questions here just so people don't feel neglected. Let's see. Robert Garrett says, good question. I'm excited. Tan Zuali is watching. Thanks for waving, Tan or Than. Pablo Nombella is watching. Pablo, every Sunday night. Yeah, I'm giving you a big thumbs up, buddy. Thank you. Gael Pitts Black is watching. Let's see. Gael, thank you for waving. Gael says, so true. Well, I'm glad you agree with me. I think you're, you're referencing the Spanish talk or the academy talk, right? Guys, never send your kid to an academy unsupervised. Parents got to be on site. Come on, you know that. Parents got to be there. You cannot trust an academy to train your kid without anyone else around. The squeaky wheel gets the oil 
at the academy. You got to have the parent there, and that's the way almost every champion's done it. I guarantee you, any pro who said they train at an academy, mom or dad was there with the eagle eyes. You know the mom or dads that I'm talking about. They're there by the fence, watching everything, making sure little Johnny or little Sarah gets every every everything the best for them, you know, the best matches, the best coaches, the best ratio, the best lunch, the best fitness, everything. You got to be there all the time. And then the academies can work. In fact, I just wonder if any academy has done it without a parent. I know, I know a few have occasionally, but come on. Don't fall for that trap, parents. You got to know better than that. And that's advice that I give to parents all the time. Yeah, go to the academy, but someone's got to be there. If mom and dad are at home, that's a big no-no. Brody Queel is watching. Gordon says he's coming up to my advanced Spanish tennis drills workshop. January 21st, guys, January 21st, you can learn all the advanced drills from Spain. Conrad Cohen is watching. Thanks for waving, buddy. Hey, my buddy Ben Sterner is watching. Ben, where you been, man? Send me a question, okay? Let's see. Spencer Weinberg is watching. Great show tonight. So much energy tonight guys i had a really good weekend i'm a little i need to not teach for a day or two so i have tomorrow off and maybe a couple days off but because i did a camp up in vermont so i was teaching all week we had an awesome high performance camp up there it was a holiday camp but it was no holiday we were working our asses off okay alejandro arias or arias says any word academy versus personal coach Thank you, Alejandro. That's a great question. Guys, I'm getting through the questions here. Let's see. Yes, my feeling is it can be both. And players can make it to the top level, a world-class level, just privately. Absolutely possible. Absolutely possible. With different variety of hitters, you can absolutely do it. And anyone who says you have to go to an academy is out of their mind. That's ludicrous. But also, at the same time, academies do a good job if there's someone there running the show, like a mom or a dad or a family member, someone's got to be running the show. Someone's got to be constantly advocating for the player. And then that's when academies work. But I don't think academies work without that person. Very rarely. Very rarely. So you have to be really, really careful. So let's see. I'd like to continue this conversation, getting to some of the additional questions here. Rafa does play way back. So Scott Engie's on the program. What's up, Scott? Thank you for sharing. Rafa does play way back, but he is highly successful with it. He rarely gets overpowered because of his position. So this is a huge debate in coaching, the court position of of let's say Rafa versus the court position of say a Federer. It's a very common topic for debate. I would love to dig into it if you guys want to talk about court position. Basically in Spain, the old school Spanish academies, they teach it like Rafa. They teach it the way he plays. And there's some positives and some negatives, negatives to that. I think you have to be incredibly fast to play that style. I would not recommend playing that far back unless you got wheels like Rafa. People for, sometimes forget that he is a world-class sprinter. He would probably make the Olympics in the 100 or 200 meter. I'm, I have no doubt about that. Probably Federer too. People forget the level that these guys are able to move at. And so when, you have, when you're that fast and you defend well, and you have the personality for it, playing deeper can work. And I think you can make a really good case. I was thinking about this tonight, actually, on my drive home, that you can make a really good case that the best clay court players of all time, that's how they play. They play deep like that, like Borg. You know, Borg kind of played like that. And the, the if you look at Rafa winning 11 Roland Garros's, that's incredible how about Borg winning five and so you see the prototype for winning on clay is top spin incredible speed quickness and endurance and playing deep and consistent like a wall and that formula it wins a lot of Roland Garros trophies 
only if you have those gifts, though. You have to have those gifts. If you try to teach that style to a player who is slow, who doesn't have the elasticity to produce the top spin, or doesn't have good endurance, or doesn't have the personality for it, you have to have this personality, this a certain type of personality that can play that way. I, I want to say they're more mechanical. They're like the level of concentration and focus for those guys is on a, on a level that is superhuman. And I mean superhuman. To go four or five hours grinding like that, being a wall, the way Borg did it, the way Rafa does it, those guys, they have something really special, probably something wrong in their brain to be able to do that. And I think most normal human beings don't have the attention span like that. They can't concentrate like that. It's not the right style for them. So, you know, you see the way Federer plays, another incredible player. And I love Federer. And he plays a very different style. He's also very fast, like Rafa. He could, he could grind more, probably. Maybe he should grind a little more from time to time. But, you know, he's able to defend very well. He has incredible speed. Again, a world-class speed. But he plays a very different style, based on his personality and ba- and he's able to he he it fits his, it fits him well so i would never advocate teaching that court position and that style to everyone it has to be for the right kid but at the same time when i see coaches who say oh we can only play the american style you know we can only play the attack style we got to take everything on the rise that's the best way to play whenever people start Arguing that way, I, I say that's ludicrous because it depends on the kid. It depends on the kid in front of you. You have to find the right fit for the person in front of you, for that kid's personality and their physical gifts, and also their mental gifts, as I, as I was mentioning. So I hope that helps a little bit, and I'll, I'll just try to scroll down and, and, and check a few more comments on that. But I hope you guys understand that when it comes to court position, there, there isn't a right way. There is a right way for the player and for based on the personality, the mind, and the physical gifts. And I like to introduce both. So what I do, I call it next-gen Spanish method, the next-gen Spanish style. And I like to teach on the rise and holding ground. And I like to teach the the Rafa style of defending. And then as my players get older... They usually gravitate towards one or the other as I get to know them better, as, as I learn about their personality, and as I learn about their physical gifts and their mental strengths, then I usually steer them and they usually gravitate themselves towards one or the other. If they're more of a risk taker and they have an aggressive personality, they tend to play more up. And if they're very patient and they, they're very conservative and they like to, to react then they, they start to fade back in the court more like Rafa. Uh, I just think it's a mistake when we have coaches that lay down the law and they say, no, you, you have to play like Roger or, you have, or vice versa when you have coaches who, say, who are really big into Rafa and they make all the players play like Rafa. And that's a huge mistake. You have to have a balanced approach for those players, you know. All right, so let me get to a few more questions here. Guys, we're having a great program it's my Sunday night program Q&A. We've had the biggest audience we've had ever tonight. I'm really excited that the show is growing, and I appreciate your enthusiasm and your support of this program. I really do. Let's see. Gael says, Nick Boletari always says, if you send your child to the dorms, they will never make it. Exactly. And Nick is really, really bright. He's got, he knows how to develop champions. And I disagree with some of the philosophy of Nick, but I think he has some really great strengths. One of them is he's an incredible motivator and he knows how to pick talent. He's a great talent identifier and he's a hard worker. He's very tough. So he pushes kids hard. He's got a great formula for developing a champion. And I think the biggest thing that Nick does that's amazing is he doesn't change that much. And that's one of his greatest genius, I would say genius, the genius side of of him is that he knows what he doesn't know and he knows not to change too much. And I I see the same thing in Luis Bruguera in Spain. And I've talked about this a lot. They remind me of each other. Luis Bruguera in Spain, 
a uh, great developer of, of professional players and Nick Boletari in the U.S., one of the commonalities between them is that they don't change that much. And they work with what the players got. And they're not overly technical. And I think it's a great formula for developing a champion. You don't always have to have perfect technique to be a, to be a, a world champion. And I think that's commonly misunderstood. I think that's a big myth that you have to have picture perfect technique according to some book or some rubric or some model. And it's just not the case. And I think when you see some of the great developers of pro talent, a lot of them know to get the, to leave the player alone. Like you have the great story where Jim Courier's dad, you know, dropped, Nick tells the story all the time. It's a great story where, where hit, Jim Courier's dad wanted Nick to change Jim's backhand. And, you know, Nick took a look at his backhand and he said, well... I don't know if I know how to change that. I don't think I can change that, but uh, let's just have this kid hit more forehands. And, you know, so Jim had that great runaround forehand and became a number one in the world with what you would probably say a suboptimal backhand. But you have many examples of, of top Grand Slam winners, top players who didn't have ideal technique. You look at Stefan Edberg's forehand, for example, just off the top of my head. I was listening to a podcast talking about Swedish tennis. You know, Sweden was the Spain before Spain. Sweden, Sweden was Spain before Spain. Sweden dominated world tennis the way Spain did. And a lot of people forget that in the 70s, that Sweden was the bomb. Sweden was blowing up with Stefan and Bjorn Borg and a number of other top players. And one of the things that I think is interesting that is in Sweden... As I understand it, I was listening to a podcast with a Swedish coach, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they are not as technical as some other European countries in Sweden. I found that very interesting as an observation because I have sort of a, a pet hypothesis that the, the coaches and the countries that, that lay off the technique a little bit sometimes get better results than the countries that are hyper-focused on technique. I, I think there's some, I can make a fairly good argument for that. One exception might be the Russians. The Russians are hyper-technical, super-technical, and they have a lot of success on the Pro Tour. So, you know, I have to kind of work this debate in my mind. But one of the things that's interesting about Russia is they send a lot of their players to Spain. A lot of people don't realize that there's a huge pipeline from Russia to Spain, I mean huge. There's so many players from Russia and also Eastern Europe, also Northern Europe, but particularly Russia, that go to finishing school in Spain. And it started with Murat Safin. Maybe, maybe a few players before him. I'm not sure how many came before Murat. But Murat and Dinara, they both made number one, if I'm not mistaken. But they're Russian players, but they, they learned everything they, they could learn in Spain. And there's been a number of Russians who've done that. I would say dozens and dozens of them. So people forget that. You know, the whole the Russian Federation has a training camp in Mallorca for for their, their for their top juniors, uh, for the ITF juniors. So, but all over the country, not just in Mallorca, the the, the Ru there are Russians all over Spain, and you see that with Rublev, you see that with Kachanov. You see that with in many, many different academies in Spain. And all the Russians go there. And what happens is they get their technical training. They get their motoric training in Russia. And then, you know, when the kids are, are getting to the teenage years, they ship them off to Spain to get their cognitive training, to get their tactical and strategic training. Because in Spain, they won't change that much. In Spain, they'll just leave all the good technique alone and the other thing that you get with Russians going to Spain is you get big athletes. The Russians tend to be bigger. They're six feet tall for the women. They're six four, six five for the men. And then they learn to grind the Spanish way, and you get this incredible package. You get this great technique. You get these tough, you know, Siberian kids who are very mentally strong, and you get you get the, these 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 you get these players who are tall with a big serve and that's something that the spanish players don't have the spanish are very diminutive 
they're small in stature and they don't develop to serve that great. So there's a, this, I talked about it as the perfect pipeline from Russia to Spain that never gets talked about. You don't hear about it very much. I actually talked about it in my book, The Secrets of Spanish Tennis. I did talk about it, but it's not something that, that is the, the magnifying glass is not often focused on that. And I think it's something we should talk about more because it's an, it, it's, it proves something, I think, about uh, the way those systems interact that, that I've actually tried to replicate back in the U.S. In a lot of ways, I try to replicate that in a microcosm of my work. I try to replicate what Russia has done with their pipeline to Spain and, that, and the way those two systems have interacted. I've tried to almost recreate that with my players here in New York which I think is kind of interesting. And what I mean by that is I, I, what I can do is with my technical background, I can train kids like the Russians do when they're little. And with my Spanish background, I can train them like the Spanish do as they get older. And so I can almost, I can recreate that same system at the same effect with my players here in New York. And I think that's really cool. And it's been working really well for me. And my point is maybe even tying in GBA, the games-based approach, is that the Russian way is highly motoric. So they're focusing on motoric skills, motor skills, development, technique. And the Spanish way is very cognitive and strategic. And I think the blending of, of those two systems and that pipeline is tremendous, tremendously effective. And if coaches can duplicate that in their own systems, in their own clubs, in their own academies, I think they can get the same results that the Russians have had vis-a-vis -vis Spain on the tour. Very interesting to me, that connection. I will try to scroll down and answer a few more comments, guys. Okay, I have some new questions from new viewers. I'll try to get some answers going here. I'm sorry, am I talking too much about Spain, guys? Or do you find that interesting? Let me know. Uh, you know I love to talk about Spain. You got me started. If you get me started on Spain, you know what's going to happen. Because I wrote the book. And anyone who spends that much time putting... A, anyone who's written the book, you know how much passion and and energy it takes to produce a, a book, a published book. And so my passion is always and, and probably will ever be with Spain and Spanish tennis. Mark Velek says, what split of time do you spend in private lessons working technique versus tactics? Okay, that's a great question, Mark. And with the young ones, I, will, I overweight technique, but I try to get some cognitive training in there. I try to sneak it in when I can because I believe in some of the games-based philosophy. I, I like the cognitive approach. I like having students who are not brain dead. I, I like having students who are not just machines with no decision-making capability. I'm a big believer in training decision-making, but not at the... not without the technique. The technique for me is so important for young children. I think there's a window under 12, where if you can get the technique really good, it's a huge, huge competitive advantage. It's a huge advantage in terms of the developmental timeline. So I'm, I'm huge on that, but I try to sneak in as much cognitive and decision-making work as I can. But you have to be really careful because if you try to force-feed GBA, games-based approach to kids, and you try to sneak it in too much into the technical work, a lot of times the technical work will suffer and the technical work will, will be very inefficient. And you, you, in other words, you won't get a kid learning the skills as fast. And I think that's the measure of a good technical coach, getting the skills taught quickly. I believe in that better coaches can get the technique done faster than lesser coaches. I'm a big believer in time. I think time is an important measurement of a coach's ability. And I've said that a lot. A lot of people like to talk about development as a long-term marathon, and it is. But I think one of the great measures of a coach is how quickly you can get a child better. And what I found is the technical approach for young children, which you may want to call traditional approach, if you have the right kid who can do it, you should do it because it's faster. It's more effective. Now, some kids can't solely focus on technique when they're little. They need to have more... Of more, more games, more fun, more com competition, and that's okay. You have to teach according to the kid in front of you. But if you have a kid who's willing to do the repetitions, if you have a kid who's wired 
to do technique, you should do technique with them because it will give them a tremendous advantage. If you can myelinate that kid when they're young, you should absolutely do it. You've got to do it. And that's the problem that I have with GBA. GBA is arguing that their approach is better for everyone, which is ludicrous. It's not better for everyone. The gains-based approach is a good teaching tool. It's a good pedagogical tool for certain types of kids. I don't see the GBA being the best approach for all kids. And that's the problem that I have with a lot of the guys in England who are promoting it, uh, with people around the world who are, are, are uh, it's almost like a cult. It's basically like you're talking to a cult member when you're talking to some of the games-based guys. And, and these are really smart people, but they're sort of, they've sort of been brainwashed by GBA. And I would submit to you that there's a lot of scientific evidence that's moving against GBA. In fact, I just was researching a study online. It's a very new study from 2018. And it's a sports science study where the research, researchers, they were studying GBA in multiple sports. And the latest research showed, it was a summary of, of, of studies, and the latest research showed that GBA does indeed help tactics, it does help develop decision making, but it actually had a deleterious effect on technical development. And that's one of the latest sports science studies that just came out, big study, uh, a summary of studies, and it shows that GBA, not as effective for developing technique, pretty effective at developing tactical mind which makes a lot of sense to me. But I'm I get really frustrated when people on the GBA side, many of them, I would say, who have never developed a top player. Okay, these are guys who are conference speakers, or these are guys who are book writers or article writers or talking heads. They never actually been in the trenches developing a top player. And they're going to come back at us, guys who are in the trenches doing it. I'm doing it every day, every week. I'm a grinder down there doing it. And they're telling us guys that GBA is the best way to develop a top player. Meanwhile, they never even developed a top player. It takes a lot of chutzpah to do that. It takes a lot of cojones to get up there on stage in front of a lot of people and tell people that this is a way that's going to develop a world-class player when they never even did it before. You know, it's all just shuck and jive. It's a bunch of shuck and jives, a bunch of smoke and mirrors. That's what I think, you know. But, but GBA has its place because there's a lot of good stuff in GBA. You want to know what I love about GBA? I'm just going to keep saying GBA. I love saying GBA. What I love about GBA is decision-making, training cognitive aspects. I like the... This, this is very related to, to what they do in Spain, uh, teaching a kid to be competitive, teaching a kid to focus outwardly on where their ball's going rather than focusing inwardly only on their technical. Like that's really good stuff in GBA, really good stuff. I use that stuff. Going from an open skill or, or going from an open environment to a closed to open, I love that about GBA. I use that all the time in my work where we'll play a game, then I'll talk to a kid, I'll say, what are your thoughts about that game? What were your thoughts about how you played there? I, I still play, so I play with all my students. I'm a very good player. I still play at the pro circuit level. I, I'm playing, I still play futures qualities. I, I'm, 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 I'm close to a 13 UTR right now. So I still play with all my students, even the good ones, even the, the older ones. And I like to play with them, and then we talk about it, and you know, they say, oh, I really would like to hit that shot better. I, I, I could have done better with that. And I say, okay, you know what? Let's drill that. Let's put that into a closed environment. And then they're motivated to learn it that way. Though That type of approach in GBA is fantastic. It's great. I used to be so technical, overly technical, and I never used GBA when I was a younger coach. And now I use it a lot in my work. But it, that's a far cry from, from saying that GBA is this miracle method that's going to create world champions and all the techniques going to be beautiful of coming from a tactical perspective. It's just not the case. It's not true. I can tell all of you that it's not true. Okay.
I got a little bit off on GBA there. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to get off on a rant there. I try not to get in trouble like I did last week because you know I got in a rant last week and I was naming too many names and I was just getting too much in other people's business and I'm going to try to do it politely and res- as respectfully as I can. But I, I got to disagree w- when, I, when, I see, when I see something that's wrong, when I see something that's not right in the industry. But I, I will try not to name names like I did last week. Guys, if you missed the show last week, it was an amazing show. You guys know it was an amazing show. Whoever was on it last week, it was amazing. I got a little hot-headed. I got a little he- It got a little heated in the kitchen, but man, what a show. Uh, this week, I, I want to cover the same topics, but I want to try not to get into other people's kitchens. Okay. Matthew Simons is waving. Thanks for waving, buddy. We've got an unbelievable show, our biggest show yet. I'm very excited to see the show growing, and I appreciate all your support. Please tell your friends and share the program with others because, as you know, this is the Intelligent Tennis Learners community. This is the place for intelligent talk about tennis and especially high-performance junior development. Let's see. Scott Engie is all over the program tonight. Oh, Rafa's speed, anticipation, and ability to take control of a rally allows him to play farther back. What is your take on this? Absolutely. That's right. It's also his personality. Don't forget the mental side. He's wired. He's not, he has a superhuman concentration. The guy would be a world-class chess player, perhaps. The guy has incredible, he could be a lo- like one of the, you know, my grandfather flew World War II bombing missions. He was a general in the Air Force. And he, he participated in one of the longest nonstop flights, uh, uh, bombing missions, test flight. It was actually a test flight for the atomic, one of the atomic weapons. It was, it was a test. He didn't drop it. He, he was, it was a test flight. And it, he, 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 you have to have this in, incredible concentration to be able to do something that long with, 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 the, with endurance. And I think that's something that Rafa has. He has this, this very unusual wiring in his brain that he can do that type of style over and over and over again. And I've had students like that. And when I see a student who's kind of built like a computer like that, very mechanically minded, and they're, they're willing to do, they're, willing, they're able to concentrate at, at a superhuman level, and they have this incredible endurance they they can play that style. I think that's a very important part of it, the, the way the brain is wired, the brain type. The brain type is very important. That's another topic of a future show that I'd like to talk about, brain typing. And one of the leaders in brain typing in tennis is Frank Giampaolo. And if you guys haven't studied Frank Giampaolo's work, I highly recommend it. The guy is blowing stuff up right now. He's another very intelligent analyst and writer and contributor to the tennis industry. And what Frank is doing in the mental emotional space is very cutting edge. And he's really a trend setter. And he's, he's really leading the industry right now, I think, in terms of the mental and emotional training of players, the cognitive training of players. And I really appreciate his work. And I've been studying a lot of his work recently. It's really good stuff. And one of the areas that he's been studying is brain typing, where you want to know the brain type of your players. And a lot of it comes from the Myers-Briggs analysis, psychological tests that are, that are done to determine a, a person's personality. So Frank has done a lot of research on this, and he's brought the Myers-Briggs personality profiles into tennis and into, at, into the athletic domain. And... I think he's spot on, and I, I can't imagine coaching without knowing my player's brain type. And some of that is informally tested, and what Frank does is he formally tested with, with a, a whole series of, of questions that he asks. And I'm actually, he's actually sending me the list of questions soon. He has a, a new updated list, uh, a, a, battery, a, a battery of questions that he asked to determine his player's brain type. So I think that is very, very interesting research. And I highly recommend all of you out there, if you're coaching, if you're coaching without trying to figure out your player's brain type, 
you are missing out on a huge insight into your players. And if you know your player's brain type, you can coach much more effectively and you can design your lessons and groups much more effectively. If you have a group, if you have a team like a college team and you don't know your, the brain types of all the different players on your team, you are totally missing out. If you have a, a, a junior team, a doubles team, a, a group, a high performance group, and you don't know the brain types of the players in that group, you're going to be missing out in, in many ways uh, in terms of efficiency and, and customizing your lessons to, to the individuals of those, of those groups. Okay, let's see. Jim Kane says, all right. Jim Kane is fascinated by the next generation parabolic forehand. Well, I like to call it the parabolic forehand. I don't know what other people call it, but it's like a parabola. It's a, it, it travels on a, on a curved line. So that's where I, I started calling it the, par, the parabolic forehand. He says, when will the, let's see, with the whip rip and especially the squared landing. Okay, so Jim says, He's fascinated by the landing. Jim, you were asking me a question about whether it's the, the squared up stance that makes it a parabola. I don't think that's really what makes it the parabolic swing. For me, the parabolic swing is you have to actually look at the shape of the swing and is it curved as the racket comes to the impact? Is the player hitting the ball far out to the right? Sometimes I call it like a hook. You know, I'm a big boxing fan. And so for me... The parabolic swing is more like a hook than a straight punch. And what I see a lot of coaches teaching is a, is a right straight. And what they, what they should be teaching, in my opinion, is a right hook. And so the parabolic swing is a hooking action. It is a circular shaped swing. So that's what you have to look for. What happens with the feet is definitely maybe an indicator that, that the player is swinging parabolically. But... <clears throat> it's possible to swing linearly and still bring the foot around and square up. What I'm after is a circular shaped swing and also the inverted finish where the racket is down. But for me, that, that swing is modern. That swing is the future. It's the present and the future on the Pro Tour. And there's something about that swing shape that is producing more acceleration. And that's, that's what it's all about. It's all about teaching players to swing faster, to accelerate the racket faster. And so for me, a linear swing, a straight punch, a straight punch, linear swing, follow through to the shoulder is very limiting on racket speed. And a hooking punch, a curved swing, a circular swing with... Uh, using the stretch shortening cycle, so using the ATP sort of style from from the research of Brian Gordon and and the work of Rick Macy, I really like their research. You know, using using the the biomechanics of the of the modern forehand in terms of the ATP style and the dynamic slot and things like that. The stretch shortening cycle, where you put the muscles of the arm on stretch and you pull the racket through with your hip. That's a big part of the acceleration. And then the entire, the entire parabolic shape, the circular shape, and the inverted finish, that's all related to elasticity and relaxation. And for me, if you teach a kid that style, you're going to give them the potential to have a, a very fast racket speed and to develop MPH and RPM down the road. And that's what, for me, that's what it's all about. That's what world-class technique should be for young kids. And I just think it's a shame that we teach all these U10 kids these, uh, this stiff foundation, a very stiff foundation, also a very poor footwork foundation, very traditional footwork foundation. And that's one of the, main, one of the big criticisms I have of the, our, the, 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 our, the, the games-based approach, GBA. One of the biggest criticisms I have of GBA and U10 curriculums are that they teach very stiff swings. They teach very stiff footwork. They don't teach, they don't teach the movement patterns that you see on the Pro Tour. They don't teach the swing shapes that you see on the Pro Tour. And I think that's a big mistake. It's a waste of time. And I think it sets up a lot of kids that when they hit 10, 11, and 12, they can't produce the racket speed. They can't produce the RPM or the MPH 
that they need to be dominant. And so that is my big argument against teaching traditional strokes and footwork to young kids in U10, in uh, GBA. All right, I hope that helps. Jim, I'll try to catch that comment later uh, when I'm offline or off the program. Brian Ha is watching. Thanks for waving, buddy. Scott Ng is on fire today. Scott, I'm on to your question. Stepping into the court is a positioning advantage, but taking the ball on the rise is very difficult for developing juniors. Do you have secrets for teaching this? Yes, I absolutely do. I don't know if they're secrets, but they're my, my, it is part of my method. And so what I do is I try to teach on the rise very young, very early. The reason being is I think it's a critical skill to have in the 10 and unders and 12 and unders. Because what you have in those divisions is a lot of players who win with moon ball. And I think it's very important for players to learn on the rise so that they can mitigate that tactic, that they can, they can short circuit that tactic. Because the other thing that I think young kids need to learn is swinging volley. So I spend a lot of time teaching young kids to take the ball on the rise and also to take swinging volley so that they can beat the pushers and the moon ballers. And I think that a lot of top, I'm not the only top junior coach who does that. I think there's a, there's a lot of elite junior coaches who do that. I don't think I'm the only one. So I, I don't think I'm, I'm so special for doing that. But I think it's smart. I think you should definitely teach young kids on the rise and out of the air so that they can destroy moon ballers. But I, listen, I hear what you're saying because it's so hard for young kids to, to learn on the rise. I would say that on the rise is probably the hardest skill for a young kid to learn under 10 or under 12. In my experience teaching hundreds of kids and very athletic kids, I would say very talented kids, even for them, it's a very difficult skill to learn. So I, I try to get after it early. But I always teach or I tend to teach the Spanish V, the defensive V and letting the ball fall first. So I teach and I teach them in sometimes at the same time, I'll teach both on the rise and moving back. But I think moving back and letting the ball drop the way Rafa does is much easier to learn. And so I usually like to introduce that to my little guys and girls. And then as soon as they have a good feel for that, moving back on the Spanish V, and letting the ball fall, hitting the ball on the fall. Hitting the ball on the fall is much more easier than hitting the ball on the rise because you have more time. You have more time and the ball is slowing down and it's easier to get a rhythm. So I like that for young kids, but I try to introduce on the rise and taking swinging ball as soon as I can. As soon as I can because, because I want those kids to learn that very difficult skill. So I hope that helps. I have a lot of ways that I do it. I can't demonstrate on in this format, but Scott, that's something that I could put on YouTube very soon. That's something that I could share in social media. I, I have to show you some of the exercises that I do. But basically, it starts with hand feeding. You, you hand feed the player balls that they have to take on the rise and almost a, like a half volley. I almost teach a half volley from hand feeding up close. And then... What I usually do is I actually jump into rallying with them. So I go from hand feeding straight to rallying with the player and I give them moon balls and I give them deep shots that they have to pick up right off their feet. And it's pretty ugly in the beginning. It's really frustrating for them, but I found that that's the fastest way to learn it. It's brute force. You just, you just start giving them a lot of moon balls and junk and you hit deep to them and over time, they, they learn to take it, to pick it up. It's just the timing clicks. There, there's a, there's a, a moment where they, they just get it. I'm talking about young kids, you know, from 6 to 12, from age 6 to 12. And it usually takes a few months. But once they get it, they have it. And they have it for the rest of their life. So it's always worth doing it. Sometimes it can be a three-month process or maybe even a little more. It depends on the kid. But if you just keep forcing them to hold their ground, they will learn the timing of it, the, the bounce hit, the, the quick timing, the bop-bop. So they will learn that, but you have to force them to do it. And you also have to give them a lot of encouragement during that time because those young kids will be frustrated. They're going to make a lot of mistakes. They're going to spray balls everywhere. 
And you have to tell them, look, keep, keep doing it. You can do it. This is how it always goes. This is the process. You have to be very motivational and uplifting when kids are trying to learn on the rides because it is extremely frustrating. It is, I like to tell the kids it's the hardest skill that they could learn at that age. And if you explain it to them that way, they will be more understanding and they will sort of, they will understand the process and why it's so hard. And they'll be like, oh yeah, Chris is telling me that this is the hardest thing I could be learning right now and they'll stick with it. But you have to explain it to them that way. The only skill that I would say is as hard as learning on the rise is the kick serve, which is another serve that I teach very young. I, if you've seen some of my videos, I have a lot of young kids between the age of 8 and 12 with a pretty good kick serve. And so that's another myth that I think needs, can be busted. I think you can teach the kick serve very young if you know how to do it safely and if you know a good technical progression. And also you have to have a relatively athletic kid. But if you have a pretty athletic kid, you can teach a topspin serve very young and it can be done safely and in a healthy way. And so I think that's another skill that is probably on the same level as learning on the rise in terms of difficulty, possibly more difficult. I don't know which one is more difficult. They're, pro they're both up there. I would say those two are, the, are the, the hardest things for a young kid to learn from a motoric perspective. Okay. VRL Bunila. Thank you so much for tuning in. I, it looks like we have a new viewer online. Rafa's serve is clearly much stronger than it has been in the past. You're right, but he doesn't have much of a serve, does he? And this is a criticism and a very fair criticism of the Spanish players. They don't develop the serve as much. I've talked about it a lot. It's a huge liability in Spain. If Spanish academies and coaches want to step up their game and get back on top, they're going to have to become specialists in teaching the serve because it's a huge problem in Spain. The serve gets short shrift. The serve is often neglected. And a lot of the coaches in Spain are not really up to snuff in terms of biomechanics they don't study a lot of technique. They don't study a lot of biomechanics of the serve. And they're way behind in terms of understanding the research that's out there on the biomechanics of the serve, for example. And so I think that's a huge liability for, for Spanish training. And you don't go to Spain to learn a world-class serve. If you have a world-class serve already, you go to Spain and learn how to hit ground strokes and how to move and how to grind and all that good stuff, and you can develop good tactical sense and, and things like that. But one of the big liabilities in Spain is teaching the serve. I've said it for a long time. I've written about it. And I've also said that if Spain doesn't get their, if they don't get their shit together, you know, people are going to go somewhere else. They're going to go somewhere else to learn all the good stuff. So Spain has to evolve. I've said it many times. And one of the ways that Spain has to evolve is they have to teach a better serve. And that goes for Bruguera Academy, that goes for uh, many, many academies in Spain, and cl probably including Rafa's Academy. They just, they just, I don't know what the deal is. There's just a cultural element in Spain. It goes back many decades where the serve is just something to start the point. Sounds crazy, but I'm telling you that in Spain, there's, there's just a very stubborn cultural element that where, where, Coaches and players just, they see the serve as something to start the point. And the serve, as we know, around the world is a lot more than that. The serve is the primary weapon. And they just, many, there's just many guys in Spain, they just still don't see the serve that way, which is remarkable in this day and age. Ron McDaniel says, what do you think of Gabe Jaramillo? Jamarillo? I don't know, man. Don't get me into trouble, Ron. I, I just said that last week's show, I got into trouble. I was naming a lot of names. I was getting all fired up. I let my temper go a little bit. And now you're bringing out another name, Ron. Naughty, naughty. You're trying to get me in trouble, Ron. What do I think about Gabe? Well, if he's teaching like Nick, then I like it. And I like a lot of what Nick does. So if, he, if he's teaching like, like Nick, then I'm, I'm into it. I know I have to study up on some of his latest videos. I have to admit a little bit of ignorance regarding Gabe. I really like his hat. I'm going to tell you that. 
He's got a great hat. Looks like a cowboy or something. And he's got that accent, like that Spanish or Latino. I don't know what. He's got that accent going on. So, you know, when you have a hat like that and you've got a great accent, you're probably, you probably got something really good that you're, that you're saying and doing. I, I have to study Gabe more. If you, if you want to sh- respond by letting me know a few of his, his opinions or philosophy, I'd be happy to, you know, give my critique of that. I'm actually not sure where he stands philosophically on a lot of stuff. I've studied a few of his videos, but I, I don't know his system that well. I don't know his philosophy that well. So all I can say is great hat. Juan Daniel Castillo Fajardo is watching. You are a regular of the program, I believe. Thank you for supporting our show. We got an unbelievable show tonight. Biggest show ever. I love to see the show blowing up. I would like to take over the world on Sunday night. The tennis world. Not the other parts of the world. I don't want that. I don't think I'm qualified to do the other stuff. I'm qualified to talk about tennis. What I really want to do is get this show simulcasted on some other websites. So we, I had a friend who suggested Cracked Rackets. I had another friend who suggested Tennis.com. And I saw that we got shared on CTC tonight, which is a Facebook group. And that's awesome. But I think we really want to, I really would like to build the show up to where we get simulcasted on some of the bigger websites where we can get a bigger audience and grow this intelligent tennis learning community. I want to say high IQ tennis learning community. That doesn't get me into trouble. Okay, Tim Treat is watching. Thanks for waving. Scott Engie is all over the program tonight. Scott, thank you for sharing so much. Scott says... He's joining the conversation here. Rafa's greatness and Federer's is their willingness to improve. Rafa's volleys have gotten better as well, and you see him coming in more to finish points. Yeah, he comes in a little, but Scott, he's not coming in that much. I mean, look where he's standing. It's kind of hard to move forward from those those areas of the court, but you're absolutely right that what makes a champion a champion is a growth mindset. That's something that a lot of top coaches look for and talk about a growth mindset, always looking to get better. And the champions always do that. They're always looking to get that 1% better. And I think we should teach that to our juniors, you know, that, that character trait, we should try to encourage them to take on the same approach. Okay. Dave Schwartz is watching. Is that my old coach, Dave Schwartz? Are you out in California, buddy? Thank you for supporting the show, Dave. Dave and I have a lot of old stories that we're not going to share live. Right, Dave? (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. They're all good stories. Krishna Sarath is watching. Is that my old student, Krishna? Krishna, is that you? Give me a thumbs up. Is that you, buddy? Are you in college? I have a lot of very intelligent, high IQ students that are hitting the books at top colleges all across the country right now. Krishna, where are you at? Tell me where you're at, buddy. What college are you going to? I got kids at Harvard. I got kids at Princeton and Dartmouth and Caltech. And I'm, we're taking over the college scene. Chris Lewitt Tennis Academy. Okay. Suresh Kumar is watching. Thanks for waving, Suresh. Naeem Azar is watching. Thank you so much for waving, guys. Josh Moore is watching. Thanks for waving. Yep, Fam Kwan is waving. Thank you for waving, guys. If you want to chime into the show, don't be shy. If you'd like to tell me where you're tuning in from, I love to share with international players and coaches. And I really enjoy getting the international perspective from you guys. That's one of the great things about this technology is we can share ideas with coaches and players from around the world. And I think that's what really attracts me to online coaching, that attracts me to this format, because then we can, I can learn from people who are not in my, my neck of the woods here in my small pond, like in New York or in Northeastern United States. And I can connect with people from around the world with different perspectives, because that's, 
that's where you grow. It's, it's very similar to traveling, but on Sunday nights, I can travel without a plane ticket. And for example, on the Facebook group this week, I was having a big debate with a bunch of guys from England regarding GBA, games-based approach. And that was very edifying for me. I learned a lot. I didn't feel like I got satisfactory answers from those guys. I had a lot of legitimate questions that I didn't feel were answered well. But nevertheless, it was a good conversation, a good discussion. We had a good debate. And that's how you learn. And I was just shocked. I mean, absolutely shocked at some of the observations and comments I got from some of the guys in England where they're so much against the technical approach for young kids. They're so anti-technique, in my, in my opinion, very anti-technique for young kids. And the idea that j- games-based approach might not be appropriate for every personality or every brain type or, or every learning style is just anathema to them. Why? For me, GBA is a tool. It's a tool for teaching that I use all the time. But it's not the end-all, be-all of coaching systems. It's, it's just one method that works for certain personalities and certain types of kids. But that's not the conversation that I was having. That's not what I was hearing this week on some of the Facebook groups. Okay, anyway, Robert Garrett says, Should a ball that is hit on the rise have as much spin as a ball that is allowed to drop? Yeah, I don't think it's possible to create the same RPM on the rise as when the ball is dropping. So, Robert, maybe some of the biomechanists out there could, or physics PhDs could prove this one way or the other. But in my layman's opinion and in my coaching experience, I don't think it's – and also in my playing experience, I don't think it's possible to hit as heavy on the rise – And now, you guys out there, you can feel free to argue your point, but I think think I'm right on this. And when players take the ball on the rise, it flattens the ball out. And when players want to hit maximum RPM and they want to hit maximum heavy ball, it's better to let the ball fall. So that's how I teach kids. I say, if you want to hit heavier, you need to let the ball drop more. There's something about letting the ball drop as you're hitting up, that creates more friction on the ball. It may be theoretically possible to hit the same amount of RPM on an on-the-rise shot as an on-the-fall shot, but it's not very common and it's not very likely. And if you're telling a kid that they should be spinning the ball just like they are when they're hanging back, when they're taking the ball on the rise, I just don't think it's realistic. So that would be my answer to that question. Let me know if you have a follow-up. Ron McDaniel says he's laughing his ass off. You know, is that because of my joke about Jamarillo or Jeremillo? Is it Jeremillo or Jamarillo? I don't know if you spelled it right or I got it wrong, but yeah, that maybe you're regarding that. Okay, do you want to follow up with some of his philosophy? What does he say? Like, what does Jamarillo say? Isn't it Jeremillo? Can somebody clarify that? Okay, so what do you think is the biggest problem with U.S. junior tennis? Did I get to the end of the comments here? Wow, okay. Guys, we can shoot up some new questions if you have it. I think I got through most of the questions. I hope I didn't miss anybody. Sometimes I miss. As I told you guys, I always check the comments after, and I go through the comments and answer after. If I did miss you, please don't flame me, right? Try not to be a hater. There are some haters out there, especially on Facebook, man. Good Lord. There's some haters on Facebook. But, you know, that's the price you pay for getting up on TV and, and spouting, you know, your your opinion and stuff like that, you know? That's part of the deal. You gotta have a thick skin or you can't play the game. What is the biggest problem with U.S. junior tennis? Is there a really big problem with junior U.S. tennis? Yes, there is, and I've said it before, it's cheating. (laughs) The biggest problem is junior tennis is completely corrupted by cheating, it's ruining the game. I mean junior tournament tennis, so maybe your question was about like, players coming up, you know, and, and talent and things like that. The other, the other biggest problem with American junior tennis is we don't got the athletes. All the best athletes are playing hoop, 
they're shooting hoop, they're throwing the football, they're doing stuff like that, and we need those kids in tennis. American tennis would be way, way better if we could just stop cheating, so that would help the participation. We could stop cheating, because then more kids want to play, because nobody wants to play the shitty tournament game where they get hooked all the time, and the guy's over there changing the score. What kind of sport lets kids keep their own score? People, wake up. It's a complete disaster. The, the kid can change the score, and according to the rules of tennis, the, the, the ref comes over. So the ump comes over, and what does the ump say to the kids? He says, okay, according to the rule book, we got to go back to the score that you both agree upon. What kind of crazy scheme is that? I mean, that's just inviting a kid to cheat. It's completely wrong. The kids need someone to keep score for them. Someone should keep score. These are little kids. There's too much temptation to change the score. And somebody should be calling the lines. And what's going to happen is it's all going to be solved with technology. I've talked about this many times. Those of you who are fans of the program, you know what I'm going to say. It's going to come from PlaySight technology, Hawkeye technology. Some sort of line calling technology is going to solve all this. And by the way, the computer is going to keep score too. And the kids won't be able to change the score. Yeah, cheating is completely out of control. Ron McDaniel says it. It's ruining the sport. Why do we have hundreds of, literally, 100,000 or more kids participating in high school tennis, but we have 10,000 ranked tournament players? The ratio is something like that. My numbers might be a little off. But basically, why do we have over 100,000 players, kids, participating in high school, but we have less than 10% of that number competing in junior tournaments because junior tournaments are shitty and the kids don't like getting hooked and so many kids have a bad experience at junior tournaments that they're like screw this i'm gonna go play for my high school team where there's a coach watching and it's a little bit better regulated and i get more emotional support it's ridiculous by the way parents should be allowed to be out there coaching and there should be a coach allowed on court i'm a big believer in that and I've talked about that on this program. And I think that would be much healthier for the younger age divisions. Because the little kids shouldn't be out there just having a traumatic experience, breaking down emotionally, and not being able to talk to anyone. I just don't think it's right. I don't think it's healthy emotionally or psychologically. I've talked about that a lot too. If we got more basketball players in tennis, if the USDA would start a fund and just take a little bit of the money from the U.S. Open and fund me 20 scholarships for inner-city kids who would normally choose basketball, I, I'm pretty sure I could, I could get some Grand Slam winners out of that, or at least some top 100 players, you know, some really good players on the world stage. If we just got more of those inner-city basketball athletes into tennis, and they're not going to do it unless somebody pays for them to do it because they're all, uh, basketball is cheap, Football's cheap. They're just going to do that, you know. So that's my take on that. Guys, any more questions tonight? Let's see how we're doing on time. I'm going to check in with my co-host, Sammy. Let's see what Sammy's doing here. Sammy, got an opinion? Hey, how are you? How you doing, Sam boy? Sammy says he's getting ready for night-night. Okay. Well... Sammy's still with us. He's just chilling. If you guys have a footwork question, you can shout it out to Sammy, and I'll, I'll try to ask him. He is my resident expert on footwork. He's very fleet of foot. He's very agile, and he's got a very good vertical leap. So if you have a footwork question, let me know, and I will ask Sammy. If you have a general tennis question, ask me before I get too sleepy. How about that? Let's see... I can see that we're still going pretty strong here with participation and we are getting some laughing out loud signs. I guess my comedic talent is coming to the fore tonight, which is not my typical forte, although I have a pretty good sense of humor if you ask my wife and kids. Well, my kids don't think I'm very funny, but I think I'm pretty funny sometimes. By the way, as a coach, if you can combine a good sense of humor but also 
instill the fear of God in your students where they know not to mess around with you. I think that's the ideal combination for an elite coach. I don't know if Robert Garrett's still online, but if you recall, Robert, in the podcast with Mario Lano, the junior coach of Gerald Donaldson, he talked about that. And I thought that was quite brilliant. And he mentioned that you have to be a bit psycho and the kids have to be fearful of you. And they have to respect you. They have to know that they can't bullshit you. And I think every great elite coach has that. They have that fear from and respect from the players. And I don't mean... I don't want people to take that the wrong way. And Mario, was just, he was hesitant to say it too. He didn't want people to think he was crazy when he said it. But I totally understand what he was getting at. The players have to be a bit fearful of you. They have to respect you. But at the same time, if you can combine that with the great sense of humor and, and empathy and an empathic nature where, where you can also sit and care for a child, you can talk to them about their life. If you can somehow weave those two together into your coaching on court, you can be a top coach. You can have something really, really special. And in my experience, the, some of the legends that I worked with, that I studied with, they had that. Luis Bruguera comes to mind. Jose Higueras comes to mind, who I think is a wonderful coach, legendary, another legendary Spanish coach, incredible tactical coach. I would say, who else has that capacity? I think Rick Macy has that. I think Rick Macy is really, really great. He's a genius coach. A lot of people like to criticize Rick, but I think he has that perfect balance of sense of humor and seriousness and the kids respect him and they, they will do anything for him. And I think you got to have that as a coach. So that's sort of my, one of my, that's a little bit of wisdom, late night wisdom from Chris on Sunday night. You got to have kids who are scared shitless of you, but at the same time they love you because you got a great sense of humor and you care, they know you care for them. You got to have both when you're doing high performance. I'm not talking about country club stuff. I'm talking about serious high performance coaching. If you want to create champions, if you can do that, it's great. If you can have a kid that's fearful of you on the court, but off the court, you guys are close friends and you can hang out. That's even better too. You can develop that lifelong relationship with a kid. I have some wonderful friendships that I've developed with, with children over time. And I think those are really special. I, what I really love is when a kid gets older and they maybe they come back to you. Maybe they send you a letter or they send you an email and they tell you th the impact that you had on their life. And these are wonderful experiences to have as a coach. And also when they get older, if they bring their children to you, that's what I'm really looking forward to is I want some of my students to bring me their kids and to have that level of trust in my work and in my mentoring and in my coaching. So and then that's what you want as a coach. If you're out there, you want to have those same experiences. You want to be able to, to teach a kids, to teach one of your students kids. You, that, that's a wonderful thing. And it's starting to happen to me now as I'm getting older and getting to the point where it may happen more frequently as my Players who I worked with when they were very little, they're starting to get older. They're starting to have a family. You know, that, that kind of stuff is very exciting for me to see. But I guess my point is that when I was younger, I thought I had to be a hard ass. I thought that the only way to get results was to be like Lansdorp and to just shit on all my students and to, to be really mean and I would say almost abusive. I, I felt, I, I sort of, looked at Lansdorp and I said, you know, that, I guess that's how you do it. You know, that's how you develop a champion. But what I've learned over the last 10 or 15 years, studying with a lot of other great coaches, is that you don't, you don't have to be abusive. You don't have to be terribly mean. You don't have to be caustic. 
You don't have to use profanity to get your players respect. That there is a way to be a very serious coach and to be very demanding, but not to be abusive. And I think that many coaches don't understand that. I have many young coaches who study with me who don't understand that. I've mentored a lot of young coaches and I always give this talk to young coaches, just the talk that I'm giving you guys now. So if you're a young coach out there, if you're a coach listening, or if you're a coach who watches this later, please try to understand. You don't have to be a drill sergeant who is very demeaning of your students. You, you don't have to demean, you don't have to devalue your students, but you can be very demanding, but not demeaning, not devaluing. And I think there's a big difference. Again, my mentor in Spain, Luis Bruguera, he taught me that more than anyone, I think. Luis is a prototypical example, a paragon of being tough, but friendly and incredibly demanding, but not abusive, but not demeaning. And I think that's so important, very important. And, and he showed me that you could, you could demand a lot and push a kid very hard, but you don't have to put down a kid. And I think that's a lesson that many young coaches don't understand. You either have coaches who think that they, they want to take the recreational route and be very permissive and very motivational and supportive and positive, or you have coaches who say, I want to do high performance, but I think that to be a high performance coach, I have to be like Lansdorp. And I think you can get the same results as Lansdorp without leaving so many burned bridges and so many scarred psyches in your students. There's a way to be very demanding and very tough without scarring a kid's psyche, without devaluing a kid, without bringing a kid down, and without leaving scar a lot of scarred memories, you know, a lot of burned bridges too. And that is something that I've worked on a lot in my own personal coaching. But this has been part of my journey as a coach. And I share that with all of the young coaches who I work with, coaches who study with me. All right, Jim Kane is saying good night. So if Jim's saying good night, I think it's getting time to wind down the program, guys. Let me know if you have any other quick questions or thoughts. I guess when it gets late, I start getting more and more philosophical. I've been noticing that on this program, that as we get later in the night, the wisdom grows and the philosopher side of me starts to come out, I guess. Jim says, you are right about the style of Macy, Higueras, Pato, and Bruguera. And other... Other coaches? Let's see. The basketball, a basketball player coach told me, Jim, love your players, think there is no I in team, and be unpredictable. I worked at his basketball camp many years ago, and he was in charge, and he was fair. And I, I guess that's what I'm getting at. I think to be a, a truly legendary coach, in my opinion, in my, from my perspective, you have to combine that toughness and a demanding nature with the great sense of humor and... A caring, a caring nature. And it's really hard to bridge all of those things. It's very hard to walk that fine line. But the best in the business, I think they're able to do that. And those are some of the people that I mentioned, like Luis Bruguera, Rick Macy. I think Nick Boletari, in many ways, has done that. He is very tough and demanding, great sense of humor, and also someone you can talk to and develop a relationship with. And I think that's one of the reasons for his success. So when I see coaches out there in any sport, not just in tennis, I know tennis coaches better, but when I see a coach like that in any sport, I, I, I really think they found the ideal formula for greatness in coaching. And I think coaches who are incredibly uh, abusive and caustic or coaches who are very permissive and they let and and overly maybe too positive maybe they're they're too meek i think both of those styles of coaching are, are have missed have missed the the perfect middle ground okay 
We have another question on the board. Okay, Tarek Salim. Tarek, thank you for joining the program. I really appreciate your support. It's been our biggest show yet tonight, and I'm happy to answer your question. He says, what do you think of coaches that are so efficient that they make other coaches look bad? How does one tone down to get along with the other coaches? Do you mean a coach who is doing a really good job and they're trying to share their knowledge with with other coaches? Can you try to be a bit more detailed, Tarek, about your thoughts? Can you add a follow-up? And I will try to answer. But do you mean when you a coach who is very successful, how do they share their knowledge without sounding too egotistical or too or or losing their humility? I think that's a challenge for for many elite coaches, it's very difficult for them to remain humble. And I think it's a challenge for coaches to, if they have an innovation, if they're doing something unique, if they're doing something that the rest of the world is not seeing yet, it can be really hard. It can be really hard for, for those coaches to share their knowledge with without sounding too egotistical or without sounding like a know-it-all. And I think that is, that is a very difficult rope to, to walk. Yeah, and, and the arrogance, like you're saying, Tarek, the arrogance is, is really hard to manage too. But you have to understand that when a coach is doing something that they know works, that no one else is clued into yet, or they know that they have a method or, or an approach that is groundbreaking, that is something that's going to shake up the industry or shake up teaching or shake up tennis. They get very excited and passionate about that and they want to share it with others usually. And so, yeah, I think if that kind of coach can also practice humility, which is something that they teach in Spain, you know, humil- humility is a, great, is a big part of Spanish tennis, the culture of Spanish tennis. I think that... If there's a way to deliver it as humble as humbly as you can, that it has to be that way, and and coaches will be more receptive to it that way. The community will be more receptive to it that way. I like what Rick Macy says a lot. You know, Rick is I think one of the best, and he usually says it's not my way, it's not right or wrong. There's just a better way, and that's probably a good way to say it to a bunch of coaches. You say, I, I look, I just have this way that I think is a little better. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I, I think I found a more efficient way to do it. And you try to deliver that as humbly as you can. But it's not easy. You know, a, a lot of, I like what Rick says. He, he usually says it that way. It's, there's, there's a better way, but it's not the only way. And when you get up there and you start telling people that it's the only way, that's when people start, you know, the alarm bells start going off and people are like, man, you know, come on. And you may be right, but it's all about how you say it. And so you don't want to come off too arrogantly and you don't want to come off as, as having too big an ego. And you need to, you need to try to practice the, the Spanish virtue of humility. I'm a big believer in that. And I, 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 I'm speaking from personal experience. I think I, I have some insight. I think I'm doing some innovative things. And I'm trying to share what I'm doing with all of you guys. And I'm trying to do it in as humble a way as I can. And if my, if my ego gets too big... I have my wife to bring me down to earth, but she'll chop me down to size really fast. And also, one thing that helps me stay humble is working on the ambulance. You know, I'm a first responder, I'm an EMT, an emergency medical technician, and I drive the ambulance for the city that I live in here. And I think working in emergency medicine and seeing all those folks who are struggling and then they're at their worst time, and you try to help them and you serve them, is one of the things that helps me stay humble and it, it gets me out of the tennis world because sometimes if you're in the tennis world and you're only in the tennis world, your ego can get really big and you can start to think that tennis is the most important thing in the world and that arguing about games-based approach versus teaching technique, like that's a really important debate. It's not that important in the scope of things when you're talking about humanity you know, somebody having a heart attack 
and you got to get them to the hospital fast enough so that they, they can see their grandkids again. You know, that's a lot more important than games-based approach. I mean, who gives a shit? Or, you know, oh, little Johnny needs a little more topspin on the forehand. I mean, how does that compare to someone who's having an emergency and you just got to help them? You know, maybe a homeless person, let's say, who's just trying to survive. You know, that helps me personally keep tennis in a good perspective. And that's one of the reasons I like serving on the ambulance. So that's what I would say to you. If you are in tennis, I see a lot of people in tennis. And if they're not doing anything outside of tennis, they start to develop this warped view of the world where like tennis is a really important thing. But let's be honest, tennis is a game. And everything we do is, is in tennis is, is a lot of fun. It's enjoyable. It's our careers, if you're a coach. It's really important that we, what we're doing, but it's still a game. And I think probably the most important thing we do as tennis coaches is shape the lives of little kids. That's one of the most important things we do. But it, all the other ancillary debates, the secondary hotbed issues, the hot button issues. I mean, all those things are really not that important in the scope of life and the world. Helping children become better human beings and building character in children using tennis as a vehicle, I think that's very important work. But that's why sometimes I, I have trouble working with recreational players like recreational adults. Because at the end of the day, if a, if a lady wants to learn a better shot so she can win her, her league match, to me, it's, it's not, for me personally, it's not as fulfilling for me to, to work with someone like that than a young kid who I can really shape and mold, I can build their character, I can, I can really make that person a better human being. The adult who just wants to learn something so that they can win a local club match, to me, is... is yeah, that's 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 someone who needs coaching, but for me it's not that's not my life's work. You know, my life's work is helping children. Helping children because by helping children I'm I'm the making a better world. You know, you, you're you're making better human beings through tennis. So to me that's what it's all about. I don't want to come off as saying that the people that work with adult recreational players are are not doing good work. I'm sure they're doing good work. But for me personally, it's, it's not a, I'm not passionate about that. And, and for those reasons. So guys, it was a really awesome program. I, I would like to say, yeah, Ron, I would like to say working with adults, the, the adults that I do work with, the ones that I like the most is they let me treat them like kids. And that means I can shape them mentally, I can influence them mentally and emotionally. And I can train them very seriously and I can maybe work on their technique. I don't like when adults don't want to work on anything. They don't feel like they can improve their technique, for example. And I like adults who basically have a growth mindset and who are really hungry to learn. And so I, I, I have some adults who follow me. But primarily my passion in life is helping children. And I think that's why God put me on the earth is that's the gift that I have working with kids. I don't know why, especially young kids. That's why I, that's why I bought the website Prodigy Maker. I just like the little ones. I don't know how it happened, but that seems to be my, my purpose in life, working with little kids. So everyone has their gift, and the most important thing in life is to find your purpose and to serve God and serve and 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 live live your life uh, uh, and that way to 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 take your gift and to share it with others. You know, I believe in that. That comes from the Bible. I believe in that. All right. If you're not a, a Christian believing the Bible, I I still think the same rule applies. You you want to take the gift that you have, no matter what religion or what background you have, faith background. You take what you have, the gift that you have, and you try to serve others with it, like the Dalai Lama says. All right, guys, I'm going to sign off. It was a great program. I'm really grateful that you guys made such a big program tonight. It was our biggest show yet. We had. Dozens and dozens of live viewers. Very exciting. 
And I want to remind you guys to please share this program with others. Tell your friends. If you like the program, you know, give it a thumbs up and also subscribe. This show will be archived on our YouTube channel. That's the Chris Lewitt YouTube channel. You can just search for Chris Lewitt. It's youtube.com forward slash Chris Lewitt. Yeah, I'd like to wish you all a happy new year. We have a lot of exciting things planned for 2019. And part of that is this program. This program is going to roll on and we're going to grow every Sunday night, 9.45 p.m. And also my other show, Chris Lewitt, Prodigy Maker, is my reality show. We have a lot of exciting things planned for 2019. So stay tuned. And I think we have a lot of coaching, cool coaching stuff going on with workshops and I have some exciting young players coming up. So I'm very excited for 2019 and I just wish you guys a happy new year. And I hope you guys have some exciting things on your, your horizon. And I, I thank you all. I'm very grateful for you guys supporting the program. So have a great night. Don't forget to, to uh, join us on YouTube. All of these shows have been archived on, archived on YouTube on my Chris Lewitt channel. And if you want to catch some of the shows, if you're not able to tune in on Sunday night, you can catch all the shows on YouTube, except the one last week, which I didn't post because I got too, it got too hot, it got too heated, and I was making it too personal, which I shouldn't have done. It was naughty, naughty Chris, shouldn't have done that. So as long as I can keep my temper under control, all the shows will be posted on YouTube, Chris Lewitt YouTube channel. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Happy New Year. God bless.